Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to the Alan Bottle Radio Show on Eurofolk Radio. Thank you very much to Eurofolk for giving me this opportunity to continue talking with you and uh, and thanks a lot to the people at Grism, uh, grism.blogspot.com which continues to help me and uh, and put my work on their on their page and it's a fantastic source for uh, finding the latest information from people within our broad movement and uh, and I would very much recommend going and and uh, seeing what you can find there so uh, this week I would like to talk a bit about Julian Assange and I know I talked about him last week but I think there's lots more details to uh, to uncover and I think there's also uh, it's a very very serious matter this uh, this WikiLeaks Julian Assange story and I think it's very important we get to the bottom of it because I think that there is uh, he has a very very big part to play going forward and uh, and he is almost in a unique position in the world as a public figure and I shall explain a bit about what I mean by that uh, later having presented you with some of the information that I uh, I intend to so uh, let's let's start from the start. Julian Assange was born as uh, he wasn't born actually. Julian Assange he was born Julian Hawkins uh, after his mother Christine Hawkins. Um, uh, his mother and her and, and Julian Assange's supposed uh, biological father split up before Assange was even born, and um, and he actually took the name Assange off the. Uh, subsequent partner of his mother, uh, a, a guy called Richard Assange, and uh, and apparently they were involved in, <coughs> uh, although as I say, the um, <coughs> that that or that relationship with Richard Assange didn't last very long either, and she ended up with a guy called Life Maynell, that's L E I F Maynell, strange name, but that uh, but he was involved in this. A uh, cult called the Family, with a woman called Anne Hamilton Byrne. Now, at this time, uh, the story goes that uh, that Christine Hawkins and and her son Julian and this Life Maynell they were managing a moving theatre company, and, uh, and and they'd be travelling around a lot. And there's very very few details as to the um, sort of the whereabouts of this. Uh, group sort of during uh, Julian Assange's early years um, but we do know that Life Maynell was, was involved in this organisation called The Family so I'd just like to talk a bit about The Family and um, and how connections regarding The Family um, are kind of similar and uh, perhaps explanatory uh, in, in in the sense of trying to understand Julian Assange today, um, so the family was a sort of Australian New Age cult, uh, which was formed in the mid nineteen sixties under the leadership of a woman called Anne Hamilton Byrne, who was in fact born Evelyn Edwards, but she changed her name to Anne Hamilton and then married a guy called Bill Byrne, an an English guy. Um, so she she became Anne Hamilton Byrne. She hyphenated the name that she gave herself with her uh, husband's name. So and, and her husband, funnily enough, also took on the name Hamilton Byrne as well. He no longer remained Bill Byrne, but Bill Hamilton Byrne. Um, and she created this sort of cult around herself because her philosophy was that she was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ and that um uh, and, and basically she um she was similar to people like buddha and krishna and jesus and and that she um yeah she was of a higher a higher realm if you like um so it was around 1964 that uh she became connected with Raina Johnson who was a doctor uh in the uh sort of in, in Australia and he had gone there from uh, England he's actually English but uh he moved to Australia in 1964 where he connected with 
um, yeah, with Anne Hamilton Byrne, and they helped found the. Uh, well, they basically started started off having discussion meetings about philosophy and re- religion and this kind of thing, and uh, and they eventually bought a property with the help of Rainer Johnson, um, which they named Santinikatan Santinikatan Park. In, uh, and that was in 1968, and they constructed a meeting hall there, uh, where they continued to uh, to conduct meetings and uh, and, uh, and and do yoga classes and things like this, because she was a yoga teacher. Um, but they uh, basically they started off kind of uh, experimenting on patients with uh, things like LSD, things like uh, various psychiatric drugs like um, flufenazine, diazepam, haloperidol and chloropromazine and and a a whole host of different sort of psychiatric drugs and um, and they were uh, conducting even things like lobotomies and and things like this on on people uh, as supposed treatment for mental disorders and this was in a place called New Haven Hospital, uh, which was just outside of Melbourne, and um, and so they were sort of acquiring young people through the through the increasing following that the kind of middle to upper echelons of of the society there they were becoming uh, there was a, a greater uptake of of uh, indoctrination to this cult. People would actually uh, give their children to Anne Hamilton Byrne, who would pretend to be the the child's biological mother, and and then they would be subjected to all sorts of um, yeah, sort of be- beatings, and uh, and then sort of an an initiation at the age of about fourteen into uh, into LSD and uh, and this kind of thing, um, and they actually managed to adopt lots and lots of children. Uh, through their connections with various lawyers and and judges and and this kind of thing, because they were connected right into the very top of Australian society. Um, so there was a lawyer, for example, a guy called Peter Kibby, who was uh, who was actually helping uh, with the paperwork and things like this, trying you know and and basically f- forging adoption. Uh, or falsifying adoption papers and things like this, so that uh, sort of that that Anne Hamilton Byrne was was their biological mother and uh, and this kind of thing, or, or or however it worked. But but there was there was basically um, yeah a, a, an ongoing process of of actually collecting children to to be brought into this quote unquote family, and. Uh, and uh and for for the purposes of of basically experimentation and uh and this kind of thing um when they had the most children they had about 28 children there uh and they would yeah as i say when they would reach adolescence sort of maybe 13 14 this kind of age they would undergo an initiation involving LSD and this would actually sometimes be injected into them amazingly and uh and they would be left in a dark room on their own, and uh, and they would be visited by Anne Hamilton Byrne or, or some of the other psychiatrists from the group, and this kind of organisation, this cult, if you like, although it was a it was a cult, but it was <laughs> there were lots of medical professionals involved, and there were uh, you know they they were conducting actual experiments and uh, and administering drugs and procedures to these people so it wasn't a cult in the normal sense of uh you know you might come together and and perform certain rituals together or, or whatever no there was actually a you know they they were actually performing things to people under the guise of of help and under the guise of sort of uh of medicine sort of thing and and, and as i say these would even include things like lobotomies uh, you know amazingly enough um so yeah as i say there were lots of actual doctors involved in this and uh and, and a few of them include uh, dr rainer johnson dr eric cunningham dax dr howard whittaker and dr john mackay 
Um, and these are all, you know, like these are all all, all actual doctors involved in in this uh, cult organization with you know that were that were bringing people into this uh sort of this uh experimentation organization under the guise of a religious uh ideology that 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 this Anne Hamilton Byrne was in fact a uh was in fact Jesus Christ uh come back to earth um so yeah um i think one interesting connection to make uh is the uh the guy Rainer Johnson who who was basically the co-founder of this group and although Anne Hamilton Byrne was the figurehead of it uh, being the sort of center point of the ideology uh Rainer Johnson actually had great connections uh and um and he was involved in a in, in an organisation called the Society for Psychical Research in London. Um, that was before he moved to Australia. And the Society for Psychical Research um, is actually a very old uh, society. Amazingly, it was it was founded in eighteen eighty two, and uh, and the first several. Uh, well, you'll 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 know some of the presidents of this society because they're extremely well known. Like, for example, Arthur Balfour. Now, Arthur Balfour, the foreign minister at the time when the Balfour Declaration was made, and who later became prime minister of the UK. Um, so he was actually the president of this organisation in 1893. Um, obviously, about 20 years before the signing of the Balfour Declaration, or 24 years. Um, but there are other people who were very connected to them, like Al, uh, the husband of Arthur Balfour's sister, a guy called Henry Sidgwick. He was involved, in, and he, he actually was one of the co-founders of this organisation, and he was a member of the secret Cambridge Apostles Society. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, and, and actually Arthur Balfour's brother en ended up as president of this society as well, but I encourage you to have a look at down the list. I'm sure some of these names will jump out to you, uh, you know, stronger than they jump out to me because I, you know, I only know of certain certain people and and, and things. But many people have have their own research and uh, and will be interested in, in in other things. But these are clearly look, having a you know. Uh, rud rudimentary look through these characters who have run this organization they are very very well connected it's not some hocus pocus sort of like uh fringe organization you know set up by qu you know like uh, quacks and or you know or uh set up by you know people that are really really out there sort of thing on the fringes no these are really really prominent people involved in this organization and it's called the Society for Psychical Research, um, and uh, and as I say, this guy Rainer Johnson came from, uh, or, or was was very was was connected with that organisation while he was in the UK before coming to Australia to be involved in this family cult, and um, and you know obviously this was uh, this this cult was in operation for several. Well, I mean, several decades, you know, um, the um, uh, you know it was go it was it was going basically all through the the sixties and seventies, and it wasn't until uh, you know basically the uh, the late eighties when um, you know when when children were actually taken away from the property, which is in nineteen eighty seven when. Uh, the police raided them and uh, and children were taken away and actually one of the people that was subjected to abuse in this cult a woman called Sarah Hamilton Byrne who uh, also later became uh, what was her she changed her name but uh, sort of after, after the release of her book but I, ca I can't remember what she actually changed her name to Sarah something but Sarah Hamilton Byrne actually wrote a book called Unseen, Unheard, Unknown and um, and this was released in 1995 and it discloses a lot of the information about this uh, this cult and, uh, and, and, and 
sort of uh, published her experiences of, of actually being subjected to the abuse of, of this cult. So, um, you know, so this, uh, you know, so it's, a, it's an absolutely awful, awful institution. But um, but this, this is something that the sort of stepfather of Julian Assange was uh, closely involved involved with. And, uh, and as I say, it connects to very, very high-ranking people, including a guy called uh, Lord Richard Casey. Now, Richard Casey is a very, very well-connected person. Um, now, Richard Casey was the former Governor-General of Australia from 1965 to 1969, and he was the minister responsible for the Australian Secret Intelligence Service. Um, and f amazingly enough, the Australian Secret Intelligence Service headquarters is actually called R. G. Casey House. <laughs> um, so actually, the, their own uh, intelligence service headquarters is named after him. Um, and this was a guy that was intimately involved with the family uh, cult and, uh, and and with Anne Hamilton Byrne, um, and he was basically uh you know em employed by Winston Churchill he was connected right to the very very top of british and australian society and um and yeah he was he was extremely extremely uh important uh, as a character and um and yeah so um i think uh so that 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 connection needs to be uh sort of further scrutinized but um but yeah he 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 seemed to be involved in this in this cult too uh, as well as a guy called Ronald Conway who um who was a psychiatrist or psychologist who was who 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 basically uh encouraged um sort of <laughs> sexual contact between the uh, b between the psychologist as he was and and the, and the patients, so he would, you know, he would basically molest his his patients and uh, and encourage them to to uh, repay the uh, the dubious courtesy. Um, but yeah, he was he was connected to people at the very top of the Catholic Church in Australia, for example, and. Um, and yeah, so so so, I mean, the reason this this cult was able to go on so long was clearly because they had protection throughout the higher echelons of society, and 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 you only get that by being connected through the Freemasons or f through sort of organised uh, Jewish sort of uh, secret organisations. I I would suggest so, um, you know, when 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 we combine combine our understanding of of uh, of this family cult and and obviously things like you know they they managed to get themselves LSD for the purposes of these experiments and 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 of sort of psychologically you know uh, experimenting on these these children and young adults at this uh, at this center where did they get the LSD from? Well, there's claims that it came from Sandoz, which was also uh, providing LSD for the CIA in their MK Ultra uh, sort of um, projects and things like this. So, um, and obviously Albert Hoffman was actually working for for Sandoz, uh, and that's where he uh, he invented it or or he discovered it, you know, and. Um, so yeah, this can go right right back to the the pharmaceuticals and uh, and the very people involved in the in the creation of this uh, this drug. So um so yeah, and another interesting, I think <laughs> extremely interesting uh, snippet of information is that in the nineteen eighties the Australian police estimated that Anne Hamilton Byrne's fortune could be as much as fifty million dollars. Fifty million dollars! Um, how did she make all that money? She wasn't selling anything, she wasn't um, producing anything. Uh, you know, she, she was involved in a cult that abused children 
Um, so where did she get all that money from, and what was it for? So you know, uh, uh, what financial value to very rich people did this cult organisation have? Um, so we can only speculate on that, but you know, it, it, I, I believe it completely fits into the uh, to the idea of of, um, of the whole thing being actually an intelligence operation, and uh, and that uh, sort of the un- understanding the effect of of drugs and other sort of abuse on the minds of young people does have a, a great value to the people that want to control society. And uh, and and I suggest that that huge fortune was as a result of um, of the work or the value of the work to the kind of people that wants to you know uh, you know but basic basically uh, un- understand the effects of these these weapons on 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 young people. So um you know so so 50 million dollars you know it's a, that's an incredible amount of money for for someone and and bearing in mind this was back in the 1980s as well and 50 million dollars then is probably worth 500 million dollars now um so there you go um so yeah that is a little bit of the of the story of the family which was the sort of foundation of 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 Julian Assange's childhood if you like and there there are photos of people in the family that that sort of uh and it, and it suggested that Julian Assange is is pictured with them with with the sort of trademark dyed blonde hair that people were given in the family <laughs> um people that uh sort of didn't have this copper colored hair and, and things were were had the hair dyed blonde uh, in in the family is another strange thing kind of reminiscent of, of of an old film uh which i can't remember the name of right now but um but yeah very very strange uh organization and one that requires uh in, in further investigation and and i've tried to piece together uh, you know, like because it says literally, like you know, uh, dozens and dozens of people from the the top top society were involved in this in this cult, and and what what these people were actually doing, uh, I mean, whether or not they they would pay for access to these vulnerable children or or, or whatever, I don't know, um, but it's hard to find out the names of of these people that were participants in it, and uh, and, and and so obviously that is being kept well under wraps uh and but but, but you know I, there's there's plenty more digging I can do into it but um but yeah I think we get the general idea as to what this what this organization was about we don't I'm sure I don't need to convince any of you that giving 14 year olds LSD and locking them in a dark room uh as some sort of initiation to a cult is uh, uh is anything other than pure evil so um so yeah moving on from that i mean julian assange <clears throat> there's very little known about his sort of adult life to be honest like um there's been speculation as to you know he he was involved in hacking and and all this kind of thing and he never really uh was very you know he he was he was he he got in some legal trouble, but he was never you know in 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 very serious legal trouble, and he was always, you know, he always pretty much got away with it. Yeah, but but we don't really know how he earned his how he earned his money, how he paid his way throughout his most of his adult life, and um, or at least it wasn't easy for me to find out, uh, you know, just just exactly what what he was up to all that time. But uh, upon the creation of of WikiLeaks, um, you know, he obviously has become an absolute international superstar and uh and this was all thanks to uh the support he's had from the establishment now wikileaks um is basically uh you know the the, the reason everyone heard about it um was because the uh was basically because it was it was massively publicized in the mainstream media 
you know, he he won an award um, for. Um, let me just find find the information. He's won numerous awards from very <laughs> seriously mainstream sources. Like, for example, The Economist gave him a New Media Award in 2008. Amnesty International gave him a UK Media Award in 2009. Time Person of the Year in 2010. Uh, Le Monde Reader's Choice Award for Person of the Year, 2010. Sydney Peace Foundation Gold Medal, 2011. You know, it just goes on and on and on. He's very well uh, awarded, <laughs> and um, and you know they just they don't, they don't hand out these awards for nothing. Um, you know, we don't really need to investigate. You know, organisations like the Economist, do we? We know who they're working for. We know what interests they represent. The same as Amnesty International, you know, which was set up by a blood relative of the Rothschild family. Um, you know, they, they these these were the kind of organisations that were, you know, projecting him into superstardom, uh, and it's really really worked. And I think the reason it's worked so well is because there's so few people in the mainstream that are sort of given. A kind of persona that he is given like as a champion for transparency and a champion for uh, accountability of the state and the uh, the belief that there should be no state secrets there should be uh, the expose exposing of secrets especially secrets that uh, expose crimes so um so yeah I mean there you go. I mean, uh, uh, let me just read this bit, and it will interest all of you, all all of my audience. I'm sure who are very well aware of the Jewish element behind uh, the the movements in our world. It says, and this is coming from Wikipedia, not WikiLeaks. Uh, on first of March two thousand and eleven, Assange released a statement in which he said. Hislop has distorted, invented, or misremembered almost every significant claim and phrase. In particular, Jewish conspiracy is completely false, in spirit and in word. It is serious and upsetting. We treasure our strong Jewish support and staff, just as we treasure the support from pan-Arab democracy activists and others who share our hope for a just world. <laughs> well, if there isn't a... Uh, you know, a, a, a strong statement, a strong quote that we can give from Julian Assange exposing who he really is, then I suggest that is as good as we're going to find. We treasure our strong Jewish support and staff. Yes, and there is uh, a strong Jewish presence within WikiLeaks as well. Um, people are sort of fooled into thinking that WikiLeaks is simply... Julian Assange and his laptop. <laughs> uh, it's not the case. They do have a serious uh, following all over the world and they publish from numerous locations and, uh, and, and, and they have been publishing while uh, Assange has supposedly been a, in, um, you know, in, the, in the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, I've been slightly disappointed to hear so many people uh, you know, in in our in our sort of movement, just jumping to defend Julian Assange because of the persona that he is supposed to represent of, you know, uh, of uh, of transparency and all this kind of thing that I mentioned, without taking a single second to look at the kind of organisations that WikiLeaks are very explicitly connected to, and the individuals that WikiLeaks are explicitly connected to. Um, so let me just show you, um, for example, the people that WikiLeaks actually list on their website as uh, partners. Now I think, <laughs> you know, and so we're not getting this from any third-hand person. We're not. It's not speculation. It's nothing like that. This is coming directly from the WikiLeaks website, uh, and and who they're partners of. Who who are they partners of? Associated Press. Who are responsible for pretty much half of the news media articles that that come out globally, pretty much, 
they are connected they, or they they list their partners as uh you know french mainstream media publication le monde like they uh you know uh, russia today is one of them the guardian from the uk the guardian of all of all newspapers um is listed as a uh, as a partner the the telegraph the other side of the british media establishment the the right to guardians left the new york times uh, the washington post the wall street journal you can have a look if you go to wikileaks.org uh, you'll find uh, partners as one of the tabs at the top just click that and you'll see all of these organizations that they call partners and you know do we really need to look beyond that so any any illusion that Assange and WikiLeaks were somehow anti-establishment, somehow uh, interested in the truth, and <laughs> and uh, uh, and exposing true criminality. Uh, they would not be partnered with Associated Press. They would not be partnered with the Guardian. They would not be partnered with the New York Times or the Daily Telegraph or the Washington Post or Russia Today. It's just impossible, absolutely impossible. So. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, I suggest that that page should be enough for anyone to understand what WikiLeaks is really about. And at the same time, all these other organisations, because the ones I've just listed are but a few of the organisations that WikiLeaks uh, declares as their partners, and they, they, they the, the, the subtitle is co-publishers, research partners and funders. So basically collaborators in one way or another. And it lists all these organisations and I suggest it exposes all of these organisations as, uh, as, as particular aspects of the establishment all pushing the same objective, uh, albeit often in different ways, like, for example, The Guardian and The Telegraph. You know, um, They're not really against each other. You know, Just like Theresa May is not really against Jeremy Corbyn. They're working to the same objectives, and uh, and I found another thing that was very interesting on the <laughs> on the WikiLeaks website, and I really wish people would just do some really really basic research before coming out in support of of people like Assange. So here we go. Let's have a look at this. Uh, if you go to wikileaks.org/press.html we find a whole host of contacts which you can uh you can use to uh you know as as quote unquote reliable reliable people well informed people um and the it says the commentators listed and their contact details are publicly available these commentators do not represent wikileaks they are listed because they are knowledgeable about the topics so these knowledgeable people that they decide to list, well, who are they? There's people connected to the United Nations. There's people uh, part of the the Jewish mainstream establishment. There's a guy called Glenn Greenwald, who is a gay Jewish uh, lawyer <laughs> who is uh, who is involved in in WikiLeaks. We have Jewish guy called Yochai Benkler of a uh, of Harvard Law School who has defended WikiLeaks. We have people like John Pilger who is the Russia Today uh, documentary filmmaker which is, and uh, and who is extremely well uh, connected to uh, to Julian Assange personally uh, we have and this one really really takes the biscuit Alan Dershowitz now if anyone knows Alan Dershowitz you'll also know that he is one of Jeffrey Epstein's greatest friends. Jeffrey Epstein, that billionaire paedophile who has all the contacts of the establishment um, and provides young children for their enjoyment. And, um, and he boasts in his little black book the contact details of people like Bill Clinton, like Donald Trump, like... Um, yeah, like Alan Dershowitz himself and all sorts of people. You can have a look at this document for yourself. Uh, for yourself, it's been partially re uh, redacted, but you can see who he lists as contacts in there. And um, 
and Alan Dershowitz has uh, has for a very long time been extremely close to um, to uh, to Jeffrey Epstein, as as Jeffrey Epstein is also well connected to the British royal family and and countless other people, and and he's also been a, a major major donor to Harvard University. You know, we're talking a guy who has made billions out of uh, you know alleged tr- child trafficking and uh, and child sexual abuse. Uh, he is donating, you know, a, a lot of those billions specifically to scientific research projects in Harvard. You know, what what does what does that tell you? But but Alan Dershowitz, who also is uh, is uh, from Harvard University, he um, uh, you know, he's one of the the major legal um, sort of allies, I suppose, of uh, of Julian Assange. No, you know, can you believe it? The um, you know, this 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 awful, awful human being. So yeah, we have just a, a huge array of, of of people who, uh, you know, who who are completely, completely corrupt. Um, and you know, we can just look at the the kind of people that. Um, and obviously, I've, I've I've taken a massive jump here from from obviously the family and the and the history of the family and uh and now I'm talking about the the direct current day connections to WikiLeaks but I think um it's it's helping to build a whole picture of of uh, of what uh sort of the where Assange has come from and what uh yeah and 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 it, and it might serve to explain the connections that he has today so um so let's have a look for a second at the lawyers that have uh supported Julian Assange and and have been representing Assange and and bearing in mind there is no more mainstream establishment organization or I say organization I don't mean organization really I mean um industry than uh than the legal profession basically uh it is completely Jewish control, completely Jewish dominated and these people are reliant on their on the, on the membership to the the bar or they how they say in order to continue practicing law. Um so they're not going to be representing someone that 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 basically poses a threat to the establishment, you know, um not 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 these massive massive name name solicitors. So I'd just like to go into a few of them. And let's start with a guy called Mark Stevens. So Mark Stevens, he's been a, a prominent supporter and advocate for um, for Julian Assange. Uh, he represented him in 2010, uh, and he defended him against the possible extradition to Sweden, and uh, and obviously to uh, you know. For the for the purposes of defending himself against the rape the the two rape accusations in Sweden, which uh, which I want to mention a bit as well a bit later, but um, but Mark Stevens has actually been a lawyer that has represented the Rothschild family very directly. Um, let me just find the information on this one for you. So yeah. Mark Stevens was the uh, representative of the law firm Finer's Stevens Innocent, and he was the legal advisor to the Rothschild Waddesdon Trust, uh, which is basically concerned with the maintenance, improvement, and payment of certain of the outgoings in respect of Waddesdon Manor, which is Rothschild's most prestigious property in the UK, uh, and it's in Buckinghamshire. So basically, he has been directly um, representing Rothschild interests. The, uh, and, the, and the Waddesdon Trust, who employed Finer Stevens Innocent and obviously Mark Stevens, who is, is named in that, uh, that firm, uh, it boasts Lord Jacob Rothschild, Lady Rothschild and Beth Matilda Rothschild as their trustees. Um, so yeah, he, he's been directly employed by the Rothschild family and now he's, he's representing uh Julian Assange and and this guy has also represented I don't know you you should, you should have a look for yourself at this at this guy there's a very long 
long uh, sort of Wikipedia biography of him, which uh, which obviously goes into the superficial details as to who he has been representing and this kind of thing, you know, um, because like. <laughs> Like like the newspapers are very very reliable at giving you the correct football results. The uh, Wikipedia is very reliable at giving you the the basic basic skeleton information uh, surrounding certain individuals, and um, and yeah. So uh, so I suggest we can we can use it in that in that way. And I'm certainly no advocate of using Wikipedia to find out what happened at certain events. You know like. Uh, the Wikipedia page on 9/11, for example, is an absolute joke, as as you would imagine. Um, so he is one of the very big name solicitors that has represented Julian Assange, and another is a woman called Helena Kennedy, who a appeared on this documentary about WikiLeaks as well quite recently, uh, a documentary called Risk, I believe, and um, and she, well, I mean, I, I was I was amazed at the list of uh the uh her lists of uh of, of membership of, of of organizations for a start i couldn't believe the amount of organizations that she is uh, involved in at the highest levels um helena kennedy her name is she's the chairwoman of justice which is the uh, judicial organization i'll tell you what, i'll just just read out a handful of a handful of them and there there are there must there must be 30 or 40 organizations that she is the chair or the patron of or the president of um absolutely amazing and she's clearly clearly very very important and very uh crucial to this current ruling establishment so she's chair of the british council she's chair of the human genetics commission chancellor of sheffield hallam university chancellor of oxford brooks university President of the Medical Aid for Palestinians, patron of the Burma Campaign UK. She's a member of the board of the British Museum. She's a member of the World Bank Institute's External Advisory Council. She's the patron of Liberty. She's a patron of Unlock, the National Association of Ex-Offenders. She's the uh, chair of the Royal Colleges of Pathologists and of Paediatrics Inquiry into Sudden Infant Death. She's a member of the Foreign Policy Center Center's Advisory Council. She has this huge list of of, uh, of organisations that she uh, is or has been involved in, and uh, and yeah, you know, she's she's clearly clearly very very part of this this elite, this current elite, and she is now one of the the main uh, lawyers representing. Julian Assange and again it just wouldn't happen you wouldn't get people like this representing Julian Assange uh, if he was actually a threat to the establishment no he's not a threat to the establishment one little bit um, and that yeah and, and there are others that are you know that, that you can look up as well including uh, Jennifer Robinson Gareth Pierce and Gareth Pierce, you'd thought would be a man, but it's not. It's a woman. I've never heard of the name Gareth for a woman before, but there are women called Gareth apparently, and uh, and Gareth Pierce is one of them. And she's a very major barrister, also uh, working for Julian Assange at the moment. We have a guy called Jeffrey Robertson, and uh, and a recently deceased lawyer called Michael Ratner, who uh, who also represented Julian Assange. But um, we have a whole array of very, very elite, elite lawyers um, who have who have been representing Julian Assange. Um, so there you go. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to get on to the the point about his potential extradition to Sweden to face rape charges, and 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 also actually, in fact, the the unique position he 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 has in public life um, because. I would suggest for most people in the mass media, if you were accused of rape by two separate women, um, it would almost be the end of your career, the end of the public's liking of you, the, the end of sort of your, um, yeah, the, it would sort of make a, a permanent smudge on your character and one that would be 
practically impossible to shake off i would suggest and uh and i think you know there there, there are many examples of this where such accusations have been the wrecking of 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 careers and and uh on of and of sort of their their image in the public and um but with Assange, it's, you know, he, he's an absolute phenomenon in the sense that the accusation of rape that was made against him, the double double accusation of rape, has actually done his global popularity no harm whatsoever. It's absolutely amazing. It's like he's completely untouchable, which he actually uses. He actually uses that expression himself. I am now untouchable in this country, he says. Uh, and... Um, that because he he is presented as such a uh, threat to the establishment, um, sort of a, a very significant percentage of the the general public will just not believe anything that he is accused of, no matter what it is, no matter how uh, no matter how disgusting the the crime that is being he is being accused of. They just simply will not believe it because of the character which they have were well, which which they believe which is that he is a threat to the establishment by the way that he uh believes in exposing secrets basically um and i'm not even i'm not even saying that these accusations are true uh as far as i can see it could well be the case that Assange, uh, that this, that, that even the rape accusations were a way of testing the public's reaction to them, and testing Assange's popularity, uh, and 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 sort of seeing how, um, you know, how he would maintain his popularity regardless of these accusations. Um, I've got no reason to think that these accusations are either true or false um i think they're like i think it's likely false i think they're likely false to be honest because i think that they uh that there's nothing real about this whole thing and they they don't like to keep anything real they don't like to have anything real going on uh with regard to assange you know because it, if if they can if they can just make it completely fictional then I, I i think that's that's to their vague advantage but i think that um you know that assange could and, and likely is involved in all sorts of other you know horrible horrible criminality um but um but yeah i, th- I thought it was absolutely fascinating the way that he is he is an absolute global superstar completely completely manufactured by the mainstream media and um and yeah <laughs> it really uh it boggles the mind that people can actually like take him as a serious whistleblower i mean he's not he's not a whistleblower at all he's working with the same organizations that we're fighting against let's let's have a look at the secrets that he's actually exposing uh you know it, it, it's it's things that are deliberately damaging only to the US, only to the US, uh, kind of, um, well, not obviously not, no, not just to the US, I mean, but, um, but largely speaking, the, the, the big exposés have damaged the US with the help of the international media. And, um, and that's exactly what the whole political dynamic is trying to do, which is take down the West and, uh, and this kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, and 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 the fact that he was actually working with Russia today, uh, you know, during his stay in in the Ecuadorian embassy, supposed supposed stay in the Ecuadorian embassy, um, you know, says it all really. You know, Russia today, who also employ people like Larry King, uh, you know, like Sean Stone, like all these other characters that I've uh, exposed in previous podcasts that. Um, that they they make up facets of the of the establishment and uh and um and there really is no difference between Russia today and the western media uh certainly not in their uh intentions long long scale sort of thing they 
are just both vital parts of the Jewish international media establishment just playing different roles because they're different organisations based in different countries. And that's that's the only difference there is. There's no difference in the ideologies of the people running them. They're purely being used as uh, propaganda uh, sort of lie, lie machines, <laughs> um, deception, disinformation machines. Um, but obviously, because the Western media is so obviously uh, corrupt, uh, just 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 comparing one with another, just comparing Russia today with with uh, Western media makes Russia today look good. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they're not just as corrupt, and it doesn't mean they're not, um, uh, yeah, just 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 working to the same objectives. Um, and I think you know the 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 increasing popularity of Russia today has, you know, tells tells a great story that they have offices in in lots and lots of Western cities these days, and you know they're they're not they're not enemies of the West, you know. They're, they got offices in London and and stuff. You know, they they're not getting closed down. They're not going. You know, they're not getting, uh, you know, shut down because they're, you know, uh, sabotage. You know, they're they're spy organisations or whatever. No, they're 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 just they're just peddling different propaganda that is complementary to the Western propaganda because they want people to be drawn into the uh, into supporting Putin and uh, and whatever Russia's trying to do. Um, so anyway, yeah, I mean, the, the the fact that Julian Assange is being employed by the Russian state to produce uh, propaganda is uh, is telling in itself, and uh, and the kind of people he's meeting up with in the supposedly meeting up with in the Ecuadorian embassy um, is quite quite amazing. Uh, so if you if you're interested in looking up these characters that he's meeting up with then uh you can just look for the world tomorrow the world tomorrow which is the name of his tv series which he's produced for rt um so there you have it that's another another sort of uh very very direct connection with the global power elite which is that he is commissioned to work for the russian state and produce propaganda for the russian state under their own state-owned media corporation Russia Today or RT as it's now called um, there's other details that I want to go into as well like all the movies and all the publicity that um, that has been very very useful to WikiLeaks uh, in the sort of uh, building up of, of WikiLeaks as an institution and of Julian Assange, Assange as a sort of superhero character in the world and um, and there was a movie created in 2013 called We Steal Secrets The Story of Wikileaks and um, and guess who was the executive producer of this movie none other than Jemima Khan or Jemima Goldsmith should we say and Jemima Goldsmith is the daughter of James Goldsmith who is a billionaire Jewish businessman and um, and is extremely extremely well close uh, so well connected to the royal family in the UK and and all this kind of thing and uh, and, and and this movie was of course extremely uh, you know useful to WikiLeaks uh, and to the uh, establishment desire to promote WikiLeaks and one of its producers was in fact a guy called Mark Schmuger, who used to be the chairman of Universal Pictures, believe it or not. So we have, you know, uh, so we have the the elite of the elite that are, are making efforts to promote him, and um, and I suggest that this is why, um, you know, everyone's heard of him today. I think it's you know we should, we should actually ask people where, where did you hear of Julian Assange, and they you know scratch their head well. Uh, it would have definitely been on the news or on the or in the newspaper and mainstream newspaper and stuff like this, you know. Of course it is. Where else are they going to have heard of him? You know. Um, oh, yeah. And, and and most people who absolutely idolise him have never read a single document that he's uh, produced. Uh, 
you know it's 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 pretty amazing really that that the media can sculpt a character so clearly in in the minds of people that they will you know completely fall for it and and say yes Julian Assange is our hero you know the um and uh you know it's it's absolutely amazing to me but i think another interesting detail is the um the people who have actually put up bail money for uh Julian Assange before because there was uh you know that he was uh, he was arrested obviously um before he eventually gained sanctuary at the Ecuadorian embassy and this is all just the official story and stuff you know like so we can I, I don't really believe he was ever under arrest. I think he was doing other things. I think likely his six or seven year stay in the Ecuadorian embassy was a fantastic cover narrative for whatever other crimes he was committing. Maybe crimes similar to those of Anne Hamilton Byrne. You never know. But um, but I don't for one second believe that he was um, in that embassy all that time. No, not at all. Never. Impossible. Absolutely impossible. But look at the kind of people that um, that have, have put up bail money for him. You know, we have uh, a woman called Lady Caroline Evans or Lady Caroline Michelle or Mikel, um, who was a publisher for Random House and Harper Press. Um, you know, m- mainstream publishers that, that, have, that have put up thousands and thousands of pounds to, uh, for his bail money. We have Philip Knightley, who was for 20 years at the uh, Sunday Times and the Mail and the Independent, you know, mainstream media. Uh, you know, we, we have a guy called uh, Sir John Sulston, uh, who was a biologist, um, and he won a Nobel Prize for his gene research, and he's uh, also thrown in bail money for Assange. And um, I think one of the most interesting connections is a guy called Vaughan Smith. Now Vaughan Smith um, is the owner of a club called the Frontline Club which hosts lots of political debates and things like this and uh, and I saw a political debate in which there was um, Richard Dimbleby uh, who will be very familiar to people in the UK I'm sure um, who was hosting a, a debate and things like this. So they have very, very big name people attending the Frontline Club. And, and Julian Assange himself has done several speeches there. And you can have a look. This club's still going today. And you can have a look at the, the people that they've hosted and the people that they uh, plan to host. And, uh, and this Frontline Club is directly funded by, guess what? Wait for it. George Soros and his Open Society Foundation. So um so yeah so we have we have people directly funded by George Soros involved in the uh protection of Julian Assange and if I um and and it was actually this uh this guy Vaughn Smith who Assange was given refuge at he Assange after he was arrested he needed a place to stay sort of thing he needed a bail address and uh, and he st- actually stayed at the Frontline Club in London, which was owned by this Vaughan Smith guy, funded by George Soros. And then he actually lived at Vaughan Smith's private home, uh, believe it or not. So he was actually given his own, you know, <laughs> he, 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 he opened his own house to let Assange stay there. Um, you know, it's absolutely, absolutely amazing. So, so we have Soros's money directly involved in Assange as well. So... I mean, do I mean obviously there's 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 plenty more that can be uh, exposed about about Assange, um, but um, you know but I I really think that, uh, yeah I, I mean I, I and I hope I've given you lots of threads to follow if you fancy following them and uh, and finding out other information because there's an awful lot of of information to to delve into and. Uh, and I and I and I really think that Assange is still working for the same people that were, uh, or the same organisations at least that were uh, responsible for the experiments going on in the family in Australia. I believe he's still very well connected with the CIA, with uh, the Tavistock Institute, and with all these kind of 
sort of elite international organisations, um, which is exactly why they have felt so comfortable in projecting this character into the absolute, you know, yeah, in, in, in sort of intergalactic superstardom, you know, the, as, as this, as this, uh, this Julian Assange character. Um, and, and, and yeah, I really think that, uh, the, that this information should be sufficient <laughs> for, for, for people to, uh, to no longer support him. We can, you know, and, and it's not to say we don't support transparency. It's not to say we don't support the, uh, you know, the disclosing of documents that, that prove criminality, especially if the law enforcement organisations, as they rarely do, they don't follow up on elite criminality. And, and, and we do need to, uh, you know, make, make the elite accountable and things like this. I'm just saying that that is not what Assange's role is. Assange's role is to, you know, actually to to use the the following of WikiLeaks to pressurize governments and uh, and, and and actually force an uh, an agenda onto onto various institutions or or, inter or national governments uh, that is you know. Uh, that is desired by the people Assange is working for the globalist agenda, basically, and that's what uh, that's what Assange's role is, I think. You know, An another interesting aspect of what WikiLeaks managed to do was in Iceland when they were responsible for the exposing of of banks in Iceland and uh, and this kind of thing, and uh, and you know it it created a <clears throat> you know big big waves in Iceland, sort of thing, and it it, it you know. There were serious, you know, very very serious political consequences to WikiLeaks actions in in Iceland, and it was actually admitted that um, between Julian Assange and, and I think five other people, they actually sat down and wrote Iceland's political uh, sort of declaration, which was then unanimously uh, sort of ratified by the Icelandic government. So. For, you know, in, in Iceland, as, uh, concerning Iceland, they have actually been involved in, you know, but basically amending their constitution almost. You know, uh, writing laws. You know, for 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 uh, for a sovereign nation. You know, a supposedly sovereign nation, um, because this is the influence they have. They are actually extremely, extremely dangerous, and. Um, yeah, and, and and especially as people just believe what they what what WikiLeaks are saying because of the you know the way the way that they've been presented in the media basically uh, uh, people just believe believe it if it's coming from WikiLeaks. There's basically too too much damning information about WikiLeaks to ignore. I would suggest you know like you're living in a dream world if you think that WikiLeaks is actually there. You know, is there to help us? Is there to actually? Uh, stop any meaningful criminal agenda that the establishment are doing because it's it's my strong suggestion to you that it's only because of the establishment that WikiLeaks is uh is where it is today in in absolute superstardom and uh and and with yeah an almost sort of untouchable following sort of thing and I, people that will uh you know that have completely got hooked on the concept of WikiLeaks as it's been presented by the mainstream media. I've also made some observations about Julian Assange's kind of uh, the way he carries himself, the way he talks, and and this kind of thing. And uh, and it always seems to me that when he's talking, it looks as though he's got something else on his mind, sort of thing. He's not really quite there. He's not, you know, he he. And he, and, he, and he talks very much like a politician and things like this, you know. Uh, and, um, you know, I really think the guy is, uh, you know, if you actually look at him, and, and he's actually very much sort of creeped uh, creeped people out in the past. Um, like, for example, the guy that, w that I mentioned in last week's episode where that was running a audio studio that Assange... Uh, 
went to while he was supposedly on house arrest uh, in order to record his Simpsons episode, which was about him. Um, so, yeah, my, my initial sort of uh, impressions of him from watching him actually talk and, and, uh, and, and act uh, it just really, really, I don't know, just creeps me out. And I, I, and I think that, you know... Um, you know, he just behaves. He behaves like a, an intelligence asset, and uh, and uh, and that you know, he he really doesn't come across as as trustworthy in, in the slightest. But um, I'd like to also introduce you all now to my wonderful better half, Maria, who has also some comments on Julian Assange and and particularly his appearance. Um, so um, so here here's Maria. Hello. <laughs> yeah, so um, I noticed a couple of things about his hair, actually, because um, I have quite a historic relationship with bleach. Um, I actually started bleaching my hair when I was 14, so I'm now 24, so that um, relationship has lasted for a decade, and the bleach is only just growing out the ends of my hair. So I'm nearly bleach free. I spent all those years dealing with bleach. And I can tell from looking at his hair that his style is basically a very hard to achieve sort of style. It's not kind of easily obtained with your own, with your general DIY kit. Um, so I would say that with his hair being so smooth and so impeccably white all the time, um, that he's certainly got his own hair stylist helping him with that. Now, you might think that um, he's just a really, really odd guy. And I don't know, is he supposed to have earned money? As the story goes, is he supposed to have earned a lot of money through his WikiLeaks well, endeavors? Or... I mean, they have been getting uh, large donations, of which they actually, ironically, for WikiLeaks, they keep secret. <laughs> um but WikiLeaks, <laughs> at least on the face of it, s sort of spend a lot less money than they uh, bring in through donations. Mm. So, um, so yeah, no, he, he does have money. And I, I've seen another website which suggests he actually earns $10 million a month. <laughs> oh, wow. um, and that wouldn't entirely Blimey. surprise me. Um, but again, it's very uh, difficult to... I mean, because you'd have thought something like WikiLeaks wouldn't cost that much money to actually run. And if he's achieving, you know, like global donations at, you know, to quite large extents, then there's probably a lot of excess money swishing around, I would suggest. Well, yeah, because I was wondering if he was known as someone who's profited quite a lot from this from this organisation that he's set up. Because, that, because on the topic of his hair, uh, if he was known to have quite a lot of money then people might think that he's just an odd guy living in exile with his own hairdresser sorting his hair out but to me it's kind of more likely that he's just a total fake character who you know is helped out by stylists um, rather than being a genuine guy with a personal hairdresser because I'm convinced that he's got a personal hairdresser from the look of his hair personally yeah I mean um yeah, I don't think there's anything real about his no. his person, and that includes his name and uh, and everything else. And most most people aren't aware because of the way he's been depicted. He's actually an extremely tall person as well. <laughs> I mean, this actually came as quite a surprise to me that yeah, he do. was so tall. He's like I, I don't know exactly what his height is, but it's at least like six foot six. <laughs> really? Like he's extremely tall. Like. Uh, and uh, but I guess through all the ways he's been filmed and and uh, and this kind of thing, they, they they kind of haven't haven't you know made a they've sort of uh, filmed him in, in in a way that doesn't make him look sort of uh, freakishly tall. Yeah, I think he comes across a bit more dweebish. Uh, whether or not you associate that with height, I don't know, but just uh they just it's all about his face and his weird way of speaking and his hair and his creepy conversation um yeah now i don't find him convincing and i don't know if you've mentioned that documentary uh there's a few that oh. um 
One, one of them is called Risk. And there's another. There's, there's been quite a few documentaries made about Julian Assange by sort of fairly mainstream media characters. Right, but, yeah. Um, well, I didn't find any of the characters in that documentary. So basically all the characters that are supposed... Whether or not you've seen the documentary, it's all the people who are supposed to be Julian Assange's sort of pals and colleagues. And I didn't find any of them to be convincing. I think people have, are so used to seeing fake actors pretending to be genuine on the news and in documentaries on telly all the time that they don't actually recognise actors when they see them. And mm. I think, you know, you rarely see someone on a mainstream documentary who's actually genuine and yeah. isn't totally lying. So I think everyone's gotten used to the lying faces, but to me it just seems completely untrue, everything that they say, and I just don't believe any of them. Yeah, I think that's a great point, actually, that you know we're, our media is controlled to such a degree and we're being told that this is... Uh, sort of reality TV, you know, like news is supposed to be reality TV, the original reality TV, telling us what's actually going on with, you know, real witnesses, real people, you know, uh, telling stories and things like this. But because it's been, you know, a work of pure fiction for so long that people actually can't recognise truth from fiction these days and they can't recognise acting from, uh, from people expressing genuine emotion, genuine... Uh, opinions and, and this kind of thing because th they don't know what it looks like on a telly. We just never see it. And I think this is why they they like to use uh, actors and, and things in, in every single event that they can. Because if, if suddenly there was a terrorist attack and there was a character showing genuine emotion on the, on the telly, um, that would stand out an absolute mile and it would, it would, it would make people realize hey wait a second this is how a normal person reacts yeah. like uh so they, they they can't really allow that to happen so they, and they have to control sort of every you know every everything that uh, that they they put out there i mean maybe we can talk a bit about the notre dame uh oh yeah thing because that's obviously the other big topical story at the moment the the evidence is is uh, is mounting up to suggest that this was actually a uh you know a deliberate fire created by people within the establishment and uh, and i think a big uh piece of evidence for that is that within maybe an hour or i'm not sure exactly but uh, in in a very very short space of time since the fire sort of erupted the media and the authorities were saying no no nothing to worry about it's definitely not arson <laughs> uh, yeah. and uh, and if that isn't a massive indication that it's definitely arson then I <laughs> yeah. don't know what it is yeah how um, could you know that quickly <laughs> yeah and why would you be why would you be prepared to rule that out immediately uh, if it's a genuine uh, if these people are genuinely interested in finding out the truth there was an analogy made with 9/11 that you know within hours of the uh, the 9/11 attacks and you know bef before obviously Building Seven had even fallen, they were all already blaming Bin Laden for the 9/11 attacks. And I suggest that this lie that the uh, the fire was some kind of accident is just as obvious because they like to state these things straight away. It really you know gives their game away and uh, and you know it's it's actually great for us that they do expose themselves so uh so quickly <laughs> after these events and give us a huge clue i mean i um i saw a bit of footage i don't know if you saw it of a uh, of a guy walking across the top of Notre Dame uh, and there was a big spark a big like flash of light that that came mm -hmm. just before the fire uh the fire started what? Yeah, it was like a caught on CCTV. Uh, it was on YouTube. Whether it still is or not, I don't know. What you but, mean, just as the fire was about to yeah, just before the begin or yeah, I think it was caught. Uh, it was like a kind of a grainy black and white image, but it, you could clearly see a a person moving across the top of the Notre Dame, and then this big flash of light coming uh, from uh, from up there, 
and uh, and then the fire started shortly afterwards. And apparently, mm. this piece of uh, yeah, it was just captured by a nearby uh, CCTV camera or so, or, or, or nearby private security camera or something. Right. Um, but yeah, obviously the authorities won't be interested in that because uh, because it doesn't fit their first hour uh, speculation that it was not a <laughs> yeah not a um, a deliberate fire. One thing that the uh, that they've been doing, I think, as the sort of stage two in this sort of psychological operation, which is obviously you know the you know the the devastation of of the Notre Dame and the huge upset that it's caused for the for the French people, the indigenous French people that is. Now there's the the second stage, which seems to me to be this um, manufactured outrage at this outpouring of money yeah um yeah i saw something saying you know um if only people cared about notre dame as much as they cared about grenfell tower which mm. is quite funny because um i mean i think people cared quite a lot about grenfell tower i mean a lot i think it's probably the biggest story of that year well actually it was the same year as all the manchester bombings and everything wasn't it so um you know, it was one one of the biggest stories of that year. I mean, the amount of attention put towards that was absolutely humongous. Um, yeah. so people can hardly pretend that, you know, people just turn their cheek to Grenfell Tower and that everyone cares about Notre Dame. And also, you know, people are hardly going to be pouring billions into restoring the former glory of Grenfell Tower. <laughs> it's not exactly yeah. an icon of of English culture as Notre Dame is to France. So very, very different. The only similarity is the, the flames, really. Yeah. Uh, so it's a really ludicrous comparison to make and just, you know, aim to draw more attention towards the immigrants and the poor people of, the poor victims of Grenfell and away from the kind of European culture that's being destroyed simultaneously, which is kind of symbolised through the, burning of Notre Dame yeah I mean the uh, the Grenfell Tower story was such big news that we were absolutely sick of it by the time a couple of months had gone and it was yeah. in the media absolutely constantly and then another few months after that we're being told that no one cared about it and uh, and it was just what you know <laughs> brushed under the carpet which is com- you know <laughs> unless people have absolutely no memory of, of, of what it was like <laughs> You know, in the in the aftermath of Grenfell Tower, then uh, then they should know that this is absolute nonsense. But I, I, I saw memes going around, sort of comparing the you know seven hundred million euros or one billion euros or whatever that was raised for Notre Dame, and compare that to the I think it said twenty eight million pounds raised for Grenfell or whatever. Um, but at the end of the day, what what do the Grenfell survivors need with one billion euros? <laughs> well, how is uh, is 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 making the victims absolutely stinking rich a priority? Um, uh, I, w- I would suggest it isn't, and I would suggest that the um, the sort of community support that those people received after Grenfell Tower was pretty much unique in the world, in the sense that there were hundreds of people don- donating a large amount of their time. There were like trucks and trucks full of. Uh, clothes and food and yeah. all sorts of resources for these people so much so that within a few days they were turning people away and saying do not bring any more clothes I mean I, I went down there myself as did Maria and we saw that there were you know piles and piles of clothes left on the side of the street because you know there's only so many clothes that 150 people can wear or however many people there were that survived the, the, the tower fire can wear you know yeah. um, quite disproportionate actually the level of generosity for what was actually needed and yeah yeah, the amount of time that everyone dedicated to that you know coming volunteering cooking all you know all of that time people put in I don't know what's happening around Notre Dame but it's not really the same sort of I don't know I don't imagine it's the same kind of community effort because it's not that people have lost their homes in this case yeah that's it you know and it's any excuse to try and like make out that people are somehow evil, yeah. um, whereas you know the, the 
the, the, the fact is that all this money, this you know obscene amount of money that has been collected or, or offered for the reparation of Notre Dame, it's been sent largely by a handful of families and major corporations, uh, none of which have the interests of uh, any normal person at heart. And one of these families is an openly Jewish family, which within a few hours of the burning of this Christian cathedral was willing to choke up 200 million euros uh, to its restoration. And then uh, Emmanuel Macron has said that the new Notre Dame will be better than the old one, suggesting that they're not just going to restore it, they're going to change it. And maybe this is part of the reason why all these extremely wealthy elite sort of Judeo-Masonic families are happy to, uh, you know, to, to offer such huge amounts of money because it will be a kind of, a, you know, a, a very symbolic um, sort of reference to the ongoing collapse of France that they are engaged in. Um, and how could you make it better, really? I mean, it's a beautiful building, I mean... I wonder what they're planning with their improvement of it, you know. Is it going to be some kind of Muslim twist to it or something? Well, you don't know, yeah, exactly. You shudder to think, really. But um, I think that's about time up for today. Hey. And uh, thank you very much, Maria, for joining me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I'll <coughs> speak to you good folk at Eurofolk Radio again soon and, uh, and just like to take the last moments to thank... Uh, Paul English uh, again for his ongoing support and uh, and, and helping me set up this uh, radio show and thanks to Bryza and Graham Hart at Grism as well for their ongoing support you can find my work on uh, podcast.com if you search for my name Alan Buttle uh, it'll come up there and you can download any of the previous episodes for free there's no paywall behind any of my work you can download it and listen to it at your leisure and um and this is just my attempt to uh to help out with our cause uh, our cause which is the survival of our people and the uh the freeing of our world from jewish enslavement basically um so yeah have a wonderful weekend i hope you had a good friday I hope you have a good saturday and uh and i'll see you next time happy easter and bye bye for now